of a thunderstorm revealed is the French team Lightning. Susan drives a steam-powered car with space-age performance. And baseball pitchers beware. No pitch is fast enough for a supervision camera. Good evening and welcome again to Beyond Tomorrow. Also tonight, Gary looks at the technology of gene manipulation. Colonies of microorganisms are being bred which could eventually break down the toxic waste poisoning our soil and waterways. And the process that fuels the stars. Hydrogen fusion may offer the world unlimited energy within our lifetime. But first, Randy sails on a board that also takes to the sky. Combining wind, water, and waves, sailboarding has taken the sports world by storm. The latest tool for conquering the surf is appropriately called the wind weapon. It combines surfing, sailing, and goes one step further to flying. Half surfboard, half hang glider, the wind weapon takes advantage of both worlds. Co-inventor and probably the world's top wind weapon pilot, Thomas Magruder, the man you see here, has taken the wind weapon from ocean surface to heights of 35 feet and distances of 75 feet. For Magruder, the wind weapon satisfies his and he hopes others need for that little extra bit of excitement. To me, it's got a whole lot more adrenaline pumping action to it than, than hang gliding did. Met up with a fellow named Robert Kroll, and we uh, both realized that the sports were so similar, they just worked in, in different planes with the the wing working in a horizontal plane and the, and the sail working in a vertical plane. So after numerous prototype designs and countless plunges into the ocean, Magruder and Crowell finally got one that flew. A combination of surfboard, aluminum tubing, and mylar sail that takes about five minutes to assemble on the beach. The most noticeable difference between a conventional sailboard and the wind weapon is obviously the sail, which also doubles as a wing. On a conventional board, one tip of the sail is attached to the board, limiting the rider to a vertical sailing position. On the wind weapon, a center tube acting as a mast allows a symmetrical wing to be tipped horizontally into a flying position. Now, once in flight, the wing has pitch and roll capabilities, giving the pilot complete control of his flight. The whole wind weapon weighs less than 35 pounds. And unlike a conventional sailboard, a wave is not required to catch air. The key is a good 20 to 50 knot wind and a feel for when to tip the sail into the wing position. A skill Magruder makes look easy. As you launch up into the air, you, you start to slow down and you hover and you look down and you see sailboards up under you. And then uh, you come back in for a real high speed landing and uh, start sailing again. So it's just uh, it's like a flying fish for a human. 300 wind weapons have been produced and sold from a Hood River, Oregon manufacturing facility. And although this is very much a working product, Magruder says his ultimate goal is to come up with a wind weapon that will dynamically soar the ocean swells for hours instead of seconds. Man seeks freedom. He, he dreams about flying, and, and we've come up with a way that allows man to do that without the risk of dying in a fall. Well, if he says it's safe, I, of course, don't have much of a choice. Now, Thomas tells me it takes about a week for an accomplished sailboarder to master the basics of the wind weapon. I'm not an accomplished sailboarder, but we're going to give it a try anyway. All right. We do. Okay. Okay. Get in and lean back. Maybe we'll leave it to the experts, huh? Yeah, <laughs> 
Dead of the wind. That looks like a heck of a way to have a good time at the yeah, beach, Randy. I didn't have much luck on that one, though, Richard. Well, I'm going to show you how to have a good time someplace else. What are you getting me into here? Trust, Randy, have I ever steered you in the wrong direction? I haven't given you a chance yet, Richard. This is actually a 12-foot dinghy, and we're going fishing. Looks a lot like a giant ironing board to me. Well, it's called port boat and it's made of high-impact polypropylene, and uh, it hinges together so you can store it in your garage. What, what goes in here besides us? <laughs> What are those? Can you grab it? Yeah, right. Wait a sec. Well, let me get the instructions. Can you guys? I got it. Listen, we'll be right back. I'm I'm sure it goes this way, but Trust stay with me. me. I know what I'm doing. is a nation of 130 million people. 12 million live right here in Tokyo. And though they're a nation with no natural resources, fossil fuels to speak of, their energy requirements are tremendous. They receive 30% of their electric power from nuclear power plants. 90% of their oil is imported. And they, like the rest of the world, are concerned as to how they're going to meet their increased energy demands in the future. That's why they joined with the USSR, the United States, and Europe in going from fission to fusion. Fission energy, the source of all presently generated nuclear power, is released when the nucleus, uranium atoms, split in half. This type of nuclear energy carries with it many serious concerns, including the buildup of extremely dangerous and long-lasting nuclear waste. Fusion energy, the same source of energy found in the sun and the stars, occurs when two hydrogen nuclei, after being tumbled around and exposed to extreme heat, combine or fuse together, creating enormous amounts of energy. Hydrogen is the lightest and most common element found in the universe, meaning an inexhaustive supply of fuel. Fusion is also considered safer and more efficient than fission, and ultimately, according to the experts, will replace current nuclear reactors and the need for fossil fuels. The process of recreating the sun's heat, which is so intense, it fuses together positive electrical charges that normally would repel each other, has been accomplished by man. It's called the hydrogen bomb. It's controlled fusion that is so difficult for nuclear engineers to develop. Physicists began making machines in an attempt to harness fusion over 35 years ago. However, the enormity of the project has finally resulted in a combined effort between the United States, Europe, the USSR, and Japan. The machines used for fusion experiments are called tokomaks, a Russian acronym referring to a magnetic chamber. There are over 50 tokomaks throughout the world, but the three largest and most ambitious tokomak reactors are found in Princeton, New Jersey, the United Kingdom, and Japan. A fourth tokamak in Russia is still under construction. To achieve a fusion reaction on Earth, scientists must literally recreate and control the conditions that exist inside the sun. Intense temperatures must be produced, which ionizes gas into a substance called plasma. The plasma is contained inside a round, tunnel-like structure called a torus, or vacuum vessel, located in the core of tokamak. The plasma is controlled by a magnetic field using toroidal field coils and poloidal field coils. Japan's fusion reactor is called the JT-60. The containment building is 120 feet high and wide. It's 210 feet long, and the walls are six feet thick. That's what you can see. What you can't see is the foundation that supports this structure. It's solid, reinforced concrete and steel that runs for 42 feet beneath the floor of this edifice. When they're ready to fire up the JT-60, they seal the entire containment building with solid steel doors. Each one is three feet thick. This is one of the troidal coils specially designed and built for use in this experiment. It's 18 feet in diameter, and each one weighs a total of 90 tons. 18 troidal coils are used in the JT-60. 
They surround the torus, which is located in the heart of this massive piece of machinery. In fact, just standing on top of Tokomak is an overwhelming feeling when you realize the enormity and complexity of this project. To date, the Japanese have achieved 11 kilo electron volts. To accomplish this meant heating plasma in the torus to a temperature exceeding five and a half billion degrees. When an experiment is taking place, no one is allowed anywhere near the JT-60. We're in the building next door that houses this massive control room required to operate and monitor every function of Tokomak. It's similar to control rooms found in both Europe and the United States. The largest computer found in the entire country of Japan was built right here to facilitate this operation. This is an exact replica of the JT-60. It's scaled down to one-fifth of actual size. Now with it, we're able to show you the activity that takes place in its big brother when the unit's in operation. The pink donut-shaped sphere represents the vacuum vessel containing plasma. The red rings are the toroidal coils surrounding the vessel. They adjust and shape the plasma. Yellow poloidal coils run parallel with the vessel, confining the plasma, preventing it from touching the walls of the chamber. The intense heat required is supplied by two separate heating systems, the neutral beam injection system and the radio frequency system. Now that the tremendous temperatures required for a fusion reaction have been achieved, the next major step is to reach what scientists call the break-even point. This will occur when the energy output is equal to the amount of energy required to create the reaction in the first place. The reactor required to actually supply electric power will need to be at least twice the size of the JT-60. Most nuclear scientists are so convinced that fusion power will be perfected and that it will fulfill our energy needs in the future that billions of dollars are being spent for its development. However, the earliest prediction for a power-producing fusion plant is at least 40 years away or the year 2030 when humankind will have recreated, at least in a small way, the power of the sun here on Earth. When we return, new hope for disabled athletes. And in France, Randy discovers where lightning strikes next. Beyond Tomorrow is brought to you by Disney Infant and Preschool Toys from Mattel. There have never been toys quite like this before. Toys that bring your child's imagination to life. You've heard the phrase, the loneliness of the long distance runner? Well, never on Sunday, at least Sunday in Central Park, where runners rule every bike path and roadway. Now, the park's seen its share of weekend athletes and world-class runners like Patty Rosbeck, who's been an amputee since the age of six. But it wasn't until a few years ago, after participating in an experimental amputee rehabilitation program, that she set the women's amputee world record at the New York Marathon of just over four hours. Well, now she directs that program, known as Aspire. It's a revolutionary new concept in conditioning that has other amputees like Sarah matching her stride for stride. If you work out that hard and if you achieve an athletic um, um, excellence like that, it really counteracts the feeling of, of being disabled. Go! Better! Go, Perhaps go. the best testament to that was the recent Paralympics in Seoul, where two graduates of the Aspire program quickly dispelled the myth that an amputee can't be an athlete. 28-year-old Dennis Oler was an athlete before a freak car accident resulted in the above-knee amputation of his leg. Todd Schaffhauser, like so many other amputee patients, lost his leg to cancer, yet both won gold medals, with Dennis running a world record 100 meter in 11.57 seconds. Now that's better than many able-bodied runners, and all as a result of the highly specialized conditioning program that began at New York's Hospital for Special Surgery. It's the first time the researchers have conducted a comprehensive study on the extent of an amputee's handicap. Whew, and what they discovered is that amputees burn more oxygen at a slower rate of speed, but at a greater percentage of maximum aerobic capacity. The result is constant fatigue. And so, 
by improving on the aerobic capacity, you eliminate that fatigue and allow an amputee the chance at a far more normal way of life. There are actually two parts to the program. The first takes place here at the pathokinesiology lab, where sophisticated testing is conducted, this to measure the extent of oxygen consumption and also heart rate. Six minute mile. Once the extent of an amputee's Five handicap has been determined, he or she is placed in what is considered the core of the program. Six months of physical rehabilitation, and this takes place at the sports medicine center at the hospital. What we're finding now is they can do everything we say they can't do, and they can probably far exceed any expectation we have. I mean, the normal able bodies have kind of far exceeded what medicine thought they could do in long distance and swimming. Now the uh, quote unquote handicapped or physically challenged is doing the same thing. Sarah Reinerston is a prime example. Born with proximal femoral deficiency or an underdeveloped thigh, it resulted in the amputation of her leg. And this was a decision that Sarah was a part of. But this is my knee and it has a spring in it. And around the spring is a is a white knob right there. And you turn the knob, compressing since receiving this somewhat bionic looking piece of equipment, Sarah has set yet another world record. And as Aspire continues to turn out athletes of her capability, prosthetic designers are now finding they must continue to advance their technology to keep pace. Things have changed a lot with prostheses over the years, especially when you look at this homemade model. Now, I have absolutely no idea when this was made, but I can tell you some of the materials it was made with. This is a bicycle chain. Now, this leg was made back in 1925, and its primary material is aluminum. But how about this one? This is circa 1952. Now, can't you just see somebody strapping that on and running a few miles? It brings to mind the whole issue of prostheses and the fact that we now have kids that can outrun probably you and I. The problem is they're outrunning their artificial legs. Ironically, that's and perhaps that Patty's greatest on. success story. Off. For the first time, the designers of artificial okay. legs are having to keep up with their patients. Pull, just pull. Yeah, I can't get a hold no, just pull the whole, oh, thing. the whole thing. Yeah, just pull. Oh, it, it won't come off at all. It won't come off. You see, so what happens is you put the pin through that, and that's what holds it to the leg. Oh, no. Now, this not only keeps it on me yeah. without having to wear any straps or anything, yeah. but because it's so adherent to the skin, I don't get any friction, so I don't get any blisters anymore. Yeah. When I grew up, there were no athletics particularly for amputees. Today you have the added competition of being able to compete against somebody in your same category. And I think that that is something that is very exciting because it gives you a feeling of um, tremendous accomplishment to be able to go out against somebody else and beat them and win. I mean, everybody likes to win. This technology will no doubt be refined even further in the years ahead, but at long last, the loneliness of the disabled athlete would appear to be a thing of the past. And of course, that's thanks to Aspire and Patty Rosbach. She's offered something that, something, something that you can't describe in words. Something that, that's given a lot of people something to think about, something to look forward to. Something I just can't describe. Just so great. It's fabulous. Come on, fishy. Come on, come on. Bite, 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 bite. Okay, so we figured out how the port boat goes together. I told you we could do it. I wondered. Now it's time to start worrying the fish. Of course, we're not going to just dangle a line. Never give a fish an even break, that's what I say. Me too. Right now, I'm checking out this spot with the latest in sonar equipment. Now, you wouldn't normally use this in a dinghy. It needs to be properly mounted in a cabin, and the transducer here should be attached under the boat. But when it's set up, it works like any naval sonar timing sound waves as they bounce off the bottom. This liquid crystal display shows you the shape of the seafloor below us, along with the depth and water temperature. You can also adjust the sensitivity so that individual fish show up. I think there's one down there, Richard. Where? Down there, right at 90 feet. Over to you. Take it, take it, take it. This is the Ryobi reel. It has a built-in computer. It's telling me how much line I've released. I'm down to 90 feet right now, and wait, I'm starting to feel a nibble. Wait, wait. And when you're sure you've hooked a fish, yeah, I got one. It's just a matter of pressing this button to haul it in. It's pretty easy, huh? No tangled line with this baby. If the drag has been adjusted properly, the computer lets the fish fight for a while, 
while you tire it out. That doesn't sound very fair to Not me. Not at all. And when it's about 15 feet away, an alarm tells you when it's an alarm you tells it. you when it's time to haul the fish in. There she blows. You sure it's not a snag? Nope. You got a net? Uh, will this work? I didn't ask for a blunt object, but I'm sure that <laughs> will help. Get him in here. Get him in here. <laughs> <laughs> no one's going to believe this. Gary will. <laughs> I like this indoor fishing stuff. Oh, yeah. It's easy. Ben Franklin, who was later credited with discovering electricity, found them intriguing. These bolts of electricity that tear through our skies during a storm. A single bolt possesses millions of bolts capable of shattering almost anything it strikes. Although lightning alone rarely kills, the storms it generates from often do. For scientists, to learn more about lightning is to ultimately know more about storms. With all our knowledge of weather, lightning is still somewhat of a mysterious phenomenon. But here in France, where some of the world's worst lightning storms take place, the mysteries are beginning to unfold, with the help of this sophisticated sensor and 15 others like it. When lightning strikes within 200 miles of here, the sensor picks up the electromagnetic impulses and relay them back to a unique facility in Paris called Meteorage, where a group of scientists compile the world's most up-to-date information on air-to-ground lightning strikes. Meteorologists and computer scientists make up the team. Their tools are the sensors in the field, also known as direction finders, and the latest in graphic radar and satellite weather detection equipment. But what separates Meteorage from other companies is its acquired knowledge of lightning and the business sense to sell it to customers wanting immediate information on approaching storms. The images that we see here are much like those used by meteorologists, for example, radar and satellite pictures. This one indicates cloud cover and the intensity of a storm. But this screen over here is where Meteorage's system differs. Here we see where each lightning bolt strikes the ground, indicated by a dot. A beat tells us exactly when. Right now we have a storm over the south of France. The different colors signify exactly when that strike occurred and are used to track the progression of each individual storm. The incredible value of this system was recognized on July 23, 1988, when France experienced its worst lightning storm in history. 36,822 air-to-ground impacts were recorded, and at one point during the storm, over 10 strikes per second were being logged in the computer. Meteorage was able to predict where the most intense lightning was likely to occur during the storm by relating it to the path of dots and beeps as they registered on the computer screen that kind of information that Meteorage sells to its subscribers. Places like high-tech businesses where a storm, and worse, lightning, could wreak havoc with their equipment. Some clients have a direct line from Meteorage to their own graphic computer, providing real-time information on storms. Others get their desired information via telephone or through hard copy materials, like maps, all of which is generated from here. This machine here can also automatically shut off or switch power sources on a client's valuable equipment that might be destroyed by a power surge from a lightning bolt. In addition to the most up-to-date storm information, scientists here at Meteorage are also compiling new data on lightning that might surprise some forecasters. We found out that the, the amplitude of lightning is much higher in winter than in, in summer. So even though there are fewer storms, they can be more destructive. We've learned also that there are two types of lightning, positive and negative, and that the positive are much more destructive to uh, electronics equipment, and that also in the winter there are many more uh, positive flashes. Uh, we're also beginning to determine the regions in France where lightning strikes more often. Meteorage plans to expand its operations beyond France to other parts of Europe, the U.S., and Australia. Will it ever replace your favorite forecaster? Probably not. But what it will do is someday add to his resources and ultimately provide you with the most accurate information on storm activity. After the break, instant replays in the strike zone aid baseball analysis. 
and Susan gets all steamed up in a sports car. How well my curveball moves has always been... And a batter may miss. But now a company in Irvine, California has taken all the guesswork out of pitching. For the first time, you can not only see, but precisely measure the movement of a ball as it passes through the strike zone. Curveball, slider, split finger fastball. Any pitcher of the 80s can throw a variety of these pitches. What makes it effective besides speed? Movement. And what makes movement? Well aerodynamics and rotation on the ball. And that's what creates dips, curves, and sinkers. The supervision system now quantifies the exact amount of stuff a pitcher puts on a ball by comparing it to a computer model of a normal ball's trajectory. Four black and white television cameras are located around the field. They record the flight of the pitch at 1,000 frames per second. The video signals are sampled by a computer 60 times every second, and by using a technique called scene cancellation, only the ball movement is plotted through the frame. Through the process of triangulation, the two-dimensional image is converted to three dimensions. All this takes place within seconds of the pitch, providing an instant replay, as well as deviation measurements. In a most unusual setting for baseball, a garage-turned-laboratory, inventor Bill Huffman and programmer Lee Kui Lem have employed the sciences of trigonometry, image processing, and computer graphics to fine-tune the art of pitching. Looks like he's going to throw a curveball here. Leek and I are right now observing the dynamic accuracy test of the supervision system. And the way the dynamic accuracy test works is that the trajectory computed by the supervision system is superimposed on the instant replay. And as you can see, it exactly coincides as the ball is pitched, though that shows that we have computed the trajectory accurately. Quartzsite, the company which invented supervision, hopes television broadcasters will use their system to give viewers yet another set of statistics. Coaches can use Quartzsite to chart their pitcher's performance during the game. Is he losing anything? Should the bullpen be warmed up? At the end of the game, a record of all the pitches thrown is recorded on hard copy. This is especially useful for coaches and scouts who want to analyze a pitcher's performance in their own time. And as you can see by this chart, it gives an extensive profile of all the pitches thrown. Pitching is the essence of baseball. And sometimes you have a pitcher's duel, and that's all that's happening out there. And there's no way you can really tell what's going on. The announcer tell you it was low and outside. Well, we sometimes wonder if he exactly knows where it is. So it's a question of, of making the game more interesting, bringing the audience into it. So now they really can see what's happening. If they get that replay, man, they'll know exactly where it is. Don Johnston believes using video cameras to accurately track fast-moving objects may have other applications in biomechanics and motion analysis. But for the time being, the subject is baseball. <laughs> and who knows, it may even turn me into a more complete player. <laughs> a side of England you hear a lot about but you don't always get a chance to see and that's the quaint old English countryside and farmland. You know for centuries that's how people here in England made their living working the farms but all that changed drastically in the late 1700s when James Watt took out a patent on an invention that was to usher in the industrial revolution. It transformed the people from rural peasants into a massive urban workforce and that invention is known as the steam engine. Well, up until the 19th century, it was the chief source of mechanical power here in England. But of course, like many things, it was phased out. And nowadays, steam engines are really parts of museums or rallies. 
Or are they? From the day he entered a Rolls-Royce coach building firm as a junior draftsman, Peter Palandine has been absorbed by the problems of vehicle design. His associates included such well-known designers as Colin Chapman, who gave the world the Lotus, and who Palandine gave the fiberglass body. What prompted you to want to sit down and design a totally revolutionary car? I've always been fascinated by the uh, concept of a steam car since I read about it when I was 14 in my physics textbook. I'd never seen a steam car. At least I'd never seen one working. But I'd read an enormous amount about how wonderful they were and their big advantages. And like most people, I thought, well, if they're that marvelous, why aren't they around? And when you came to ask the questions, there was nobody to ask. So I welcomed the opportunity to build one and find out just what the answers were. Yeah, Peter wasn't around in the 1800s when the first steam-powered vehicle began operation. The problems and politics quickly forced the steamer off the road to be replaced by the gas-powered engine and a new set of problems, exhaust pollution and dwindling oil resources. The Pelin, quieter, cleaner, and more efficient, offers an interesting alternative. This is a hot automobile, literally. I bet you get a lot of looks in this, huh? Oh, yes, quite a lot. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> anybody ever want to jump in with it? <laughs> Only you, love. All right, and I've been lucky enough to ride in the Pelham steam car. Now, it's completely different than a regular automobile. For starters, there's no internal combustion. There is no carburetor, no gearbox. What else? No clutch. No clutch, but what it does have, three pistons and cylinders and a steam generator. That generator has one spark plug, and its job? Is to <laughs> light the kerosene. Yeah. To turn the water into steam. Right, now he should know, because he invented this. Let's get out of here and put this thing on the road. Right. <laughs> the Pelham doesn't have near the complexity as a conventional gas engine. The Pelham steam car operates on superheated, high-pressure steam from the generator. Now, this forces the pistons in and out, turning the rear wheel. The still hot but low pressure steam is then piped to the condenser where a cold air updraft turns it back into water and returns it to the steam generator for the cycle to begin again. Normally, the clutch isn't used during driving. Right from um, morning to night, the engine is permanently in gear. That means you have no gear changing to do and you have no rotary inertia to overcome on acceleration. The design of the Pelin may be unique to the car industry, but more importantly, so is the contribution it can make to the reduction of air pollution. Now, with an internal combustion engine, you burn fuel quickly with higher revs, so you get the power, but you also release poisons into the air. Well, the Pelin is designed to burn kerosene 200 times slower than a conventional automobile. And because the steamer burns the fuel, instead of exploding it like a gas engine, it consumes its own toxins. Steam doesn't pour carbon monoxide out of the exhaust, and its oxides and nitrogen are about 30 to 40 times less than the equivalent gasoline car. A variety of fuels can be used to generate steam, a plus when considering the demand for gas and related fuel diesel, which is steadily depleting the world's petroleum resources. Peter's pumped a bucket of money into perfecting the Pelin prototype. This in hopes of breaking the piston engine steam car speed record of 127 miles per hour. That was set back in 1906. But for general use, other modifications will be made, including the attachment of a condenser to prevent the emission of his signature cloud of steam. But Peter is realistic about the Pelham's chances of survival and the money it will take to keep this project afloat. So he's manufacturing the Pelham body to be sold in kit form, for use with traditional IC engines as a way of keeping his dream alive. If you set out to change the world, you tend to get crucified. And, you know, it's a terrible way to spend Easter, isn't it? But Peter isn't bitter. After all, the steam car is a cheap and clean alternative to those polluting gas guzzlers. Hi. <laughs>
The Sony Walkman stereo was a big winner when it hit the market years ago. Suddenly, listening to music wasn't something you only did indoors. Now you can strap on one of these and paint the fence, run around the block, or go cycling. Though I wouldn't advise wearing one of these in heavy traffic. Now Sony has taken the miniaturizing process one step further. You may have seen one of these in the stores recently. This is a television and a videotape recorder. As you can see, it's small enough to take anywhere. This is a three-hour cassette. The machine has all the functions of your home VCR, so you can program it to tape your favorite show and say watch it later on the bus. I've been told that driving one of these is a cross between riding a hey, motorcycle this and guy is an good. <laughs> there have been other tiny TVs with liquid crystal displays like this one, but they all suffered big reception problems in places where people wanted to use them, like public transportation. Having a built-in VCR solves that and gives you more choice about what you want to watch. Of course, if you really must use one of these on the move, the really important thing is to watch where you're going. Next, the pollution solution provided by nature itself. Since the Industrial Revolution began, we have been increasingly polluting our air, water, and soil. Yet it wasn't until 20 years ago that an environmental protection program began in the United States. At the time, the magnitude of the problem was unknown. Now, with quantitative data, we can estimate that our society currently generates 260 million tons of hazardous waste each year. Various federal agencies have stated that we have between 50,000 to a quarter of a million hazardous waste sites scattered around the country. Keep in mind that these figures only reflect the hazardous portion of our country's total waste. There isn't much we can do about pollution already released into the atmosphere, except now try to limit and someday eradicate the release of further pollutants into our air. Polluted water and soil, however, can and must be, as ordered by the EPA, remediated. Which brings to mind the adage, necessity is the mother of invention. A new industry has evolved dedicated to cleaning up this toxic mess we've created. One such company is Biotrol, using the principles developed by university professor and microbiologist Dr. Ron Crawford. Biotrol offers treatment services for ground, surface, and process water, as well as soil. As a professor of microbiology, I was interested in studying the fate of toxic chemicals in the environment, and I was interested in pentachlorophenol or penta. Pentachlorophenol has been used to treat wood for about 40 years and during that process the people who use it have been rather sloppy in disposing of their wastes and it has become a contamination problem at hundreds of sites around the country. As part of our research program we isolated a bacterium we call flavobacterium which is able to use penta as a food source and we naturally then started thinking about how we might use that bacterium to clean up contaminated soil and water. Every state has at least one wood treatment plant, with approximately 500 currently operating in the United States and another 500 abandoned. For the most part, lumber treatment companies no longer use Penta. However, it is still used on utility poles. By visiting a Biotrol pilot plant site, we can see the treatment of both contaminated soil and water. I'm standing on one of the largest lumber treatment sites in the world. In fact, this company has been treating timbers for close to 100 years. First, using creosote, and then about 1950, they began using penta. That means that the soil on this site contains about a century's worth of these contaminants. Contaminants that the EPA has now ordered cleaned up. In fact, I'm wearing this protective clothing because some experts believe that long-term exposure to penta can actually cause serious health hazards. But before this soil can be cleaned, it must be coarse screened to be made free of all this debris. The process begins by having the contaminated soil brought to the treatment facility. In this case, a pilot plant that's actually constructed on the property. The soil is dumped onto a vibrating screen that removes a high level of woody material and contaminants. The soil now becomes slurry, a mixture of water and solids. The slurry is agitated and aerated, removing more of the oil and clays. It then goes through an abrasion process 
which breaks up clay and soil particles, moving then into a hydrocyclone. The soil goes through this scrubbing process a total of three times. It takes approximately 20 minutes for the contaminated soil to go through the treatment process. This plant treats approximately a quarter ton per hour. A full-scale commercial operation would treat 10 tons an hour. When the dirt comes out, the difference between it and what went in is remarkable. The water that was used to treat the soil is now seriously contaminated, not unlike ground and surface water that might be found at a wood treatment plant site. The water goes into a treatment reactor where Dr. Crawford's flavobacterium eats up the penta. The result is decontaminated, purified water. The bacterium, having run out of their food supply, simply die without any harmful effect to the environment. This technology is evolving and uh, we're in the development stage, but I see it becoming a very important part of the technology used to clean environmental pollution, primarily because bacteria can go inexpensively where other processes cannot, and they also degrade the chemical completely. That is, when it's degraded, it's gone. It's not simply moved to another uh, environment, but it is completely eliminated. Hi, Richard. Have you forgotten about tonight? The cocktail party? Cocktail party? Yeah, I remember, sure. Right. Black tie? Black tie. I'm ready, Kelly. I'm ready. Okay, now don't be late. Okay, I'm looking forward to it. Hmm, I'll call my friend Don from Caltrans. Don, Don, it's Rich. Listen, I'm in a bind. Can you come and pick me up at Malibu? Great. With a bit of imagination and some help from the California Department of Transport, I'm about to take a ride into the future. Thanks for coming. Oh, Don, it's great seeing you again. Oh, good to see you again, Rich. Listen, you I know it's short notice, but do you think the e tech and you can get me to Beverly Hills in 30 minutes? Oh, I think so. Why don't we put it in, and uh, it has to show us the quickest way to get there. So we have to go to Bedford Drive. Let me get the menu up. Okay, select destination. Okay, we'll go for single street. And I'll spell in Bedford, but we only need the first four letters. First four letters will do it. Okay. B. E. D. E. F. F. Okay. Okay, we have seven choices for Bedford, but we're looking for North Bedford Drive in Beverly Hills, which is selection two. And I see it here on the larger map, and it's 4.7 miles directly behind us. We know where it is. Let's go find it now. Okay, we're on our way. Peak hour traffic congestion in Los Angeles has been known to ruin many of Beverly Hills party, not to mention waste energy and pollute the air. With no prospects of new freeway construction, Caltrans realizes a solution must be found in the existing road system. Over the next four years, Caltrans will spend $30 million developing the Smart Corridor Project, a plan to get us off the not-so-free freeways and back onto the side streets. The car navigation system, ETAC, which plots your progress on an electronic map, will one day be linked to the Traffic Operations Center. The driver will be informed on screen of impending freeway congestion and shown several alternate routes around the problem. Very helpful if you're late for a date. The first smart corridor selected for test is a 12-mile section of the Santa Monica Freeway. The system will work like this. At the Traffic Operations Center, or TOC, traffic flow will be monitored, much as it is now, by sensors embedded in the freeways. When an accident or breakdown occurs, and while the major incident teams spring into action, the TOC will divert traffic down alternate routes on nearby side streets. The aim is to give commuters real-time traffic information before they strike gridlock. The system's success will depend on the immediacy of traffic flow information to the TOC, and some of this information will come from the drivers themselves. Vehicles with ETAC will become effectively mobile traffic sensors, relaying their speed and positions back to central control by two-way communication. 
the pilot scheme will require 25 test vehicles fitted with electronic mapping and development of a transmission system to link the TOC with ETAC. Initial results are expected by the year 1991. Smart corridors sound good to me. Not only will they ease congestion, but they might also improve your social life. Hey, Kelly. Hey, at least you're on time. <laughs> Kelly, you look terrific. You look nice, too. Come on, let's go to the party. Let's do it. I know I left my pen here somewhere. It's one of life's little rules. The cheaper the ballpoints become, the easier they are to lose. And that goes for lighters, disposable razors, and cheap calculators. You can never find the things when you need them. I'm not going to have the same trouble with the throwaway watch. These are the latest fashion accessory in Japan. They're made from cardboard with a tiny liquid crystal timepiece in the middle. They're worth about $5 each and comes in lots of fashion designs. Bacon, jungle wear, here's one for fashion victims, and one for the ladies. Ooh, nice bathing suit. Next week on Beyond Tomorrow, Susan takes you riding on the world's most terrifying roller coaster. Randy discovers the point of a needle may hold the answer to safe male contraception. And Gary looks through a telescope back into time and the beginning of the universe. That's all for now. Join us again next week as we journey Beyond Tomorrow. If we told you that 21 Jump Street is becoming this fall's television phenomenon, you probably wouldn't believe us until you saw it. If we told you Johnny Depp and Holly Robinson are the sexiest young stars in the screen, you wouldn't believe us until you saw them. Tomorrow night, before America's Most Wanted, watch 21 Jump Street.